Tonight I go to Egypt, said the swallow, and he was in high spirits at the prospect. He visited all the public monuments and sat a long time on top of the church steeple. Wherever he went, the sparrows chirped and said to each other, What a distinguished stranger! So he enjoyed himself very much. When the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. Have you any commissions for Egypt? he cried. I am just starting. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? I am waited for in Egypt, answered the swallow. Tomorrow my friends will fly up to the second cataract. The river horse couches there among the bulrushes, and on a great granite throne sits a god Memnon. All night long he watches the stars, and when the morning star shines he utters one cry of joy, and then he is silent. At noon the yellow lions come down to the water's edge to drink. They have eyes like green barrels, and their roar is louder than the roar of the cataract. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Far away across the city I see a young man in a garret. He is leaning over a desk covered with papers, and in a tumbler by his side there is a bunch of withered violets. His hair is brown and crisp, and his lips are red as a pomegranate, and he has large and dreamy eyes. He is trying to finish a play for the director of the theatre, but he is too cold to write any more. There is no fire in the grate, and hunger has made him faint. I will wait with you one night longer said the swallow, who really had a good heart. Shall I take him another ruby? Alas, I have no ruby now, said the prince. My eyes are all that I have left. They are made of rare sapphires, which were brought out of India a thousand years ago. Pluck out one of them and take it to him. He will sell it to the jeweler and buy food and firewood and finish his play. Dear prince, said the swallow, I cannot do that. And he began to weep. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince, do as I command you. So the swallow plucked out the prince's eye and flew away to the student's garret. It was easy enough to get in as there was a hole in the roof. Through this he darted and came into the room. The young man had his head buried in his hands, so he did not hear the flutter of the bird's wings. And when he looked up, he found the beautiful sapphire lying on the withered violets. I am beginning to be appreciated, he cried. This is from some great admirer. Now I can finish my play, and he looked quite happy. The next day the swallow flew down to the harbor. He sat on the mast of a large vessel and watched the sailors hauling big chests out of the hold with ropes. Heave ahoy, they shouted as each chest came up. I am going to Egypt, I cried the swallow. But nobody minded, and when the moon rose, he flew back to the happy prince. I am come to bid you good-bye, he cried. Swallow, swallow, little swallow, said the prince. Will you not stay with me one night longer? It is winter, answered the swallow, and the chill snow will soon be here. In Egypt the sun is warm on the green palm trees, and the crocodiles lie in the mud and look lazily about them. My companions are building a nest in the temple of Baalbek, and the pink and white doves are watching them and cooing to each other. Dear Prince, I must leave you, but I will never forget you, and next spring I will bring you back two beautiful jewels in place of those you have given away. The ruby shall be redder than the red rose, and the sapphire shall be as blue as the great sea. So he plucked out the prince's other eye and darted down with it. He swooped past the match girl and slipped the jewel into the palm of her hand. What a lovely bit of glass, cried the little girl, and she ran home laughing. Then the swallow came back to the prince. You are blind now, he said, so I will stay with you always. No, little swallow, said the poor prince, you must go away to Egypt. I will stay with you always, said the swallow, and he slept at the prince's feet. All the next day he sat on the prince's shoulder and told him stories of what he had seen in strange lands. He told him of the red ibises who stand in long rows on the banks of the Nile and catch goldfish in their beaks, of the sphinx who is as old as the world itself and lives in the desert 
and knows everything of the merchants who walk slowly by the side of their camels and carry amber beads in their hands of the king of the mountains of the moon who is as black as ebony and worships a large crystal of the great green snake that sleeps in a palm tree and has twenty priests to feed it with honey cakes and of the pygmies who sail over a big lake on the large flat leaves and are always at war with the butterflies. Dear little swallow, said the prince, you tell me of marvellous things, but more marvellous than anything is the suffering of men and of women. There is no mystery so great as misery. Fly over my city, little swallow, and tell me what you see there. So the swallow flew over the great city and saw the rich making merry in their beautiful houses while the beggars were sitting at the gates. He flew into dark lanes and saw the white faces of starving children looking out listlessly at the black streets. Under the archway of a bridge two little boys were lying in one another's arms to try and keep themselves warm. How hungry we are, they said. You must not lie here, shouted the watchman, and they wandered out into the rain. Then he flew back and told the prince what he had seen. I am covered with fine gold, said the prince. You must take it off, leaf by leaf, and give it to my poor. The living always think that gold can make them happy. Leaf after leaf of the fine gold the swallow picked off, till the happy prince looked quite dull and grey. Leaf after leaf of the fine gold he brought to the poor, and the children's faces grew rosier, and they laughed and played games in the street. We have bread now, they cried. Then the snow came, and after the snow came the frost. The streets looked as if they were made of silver. They were so bright and glistening. Long icicles like crystal daggers hung down from the eaves of the houses. Everybody went about in furs and the little boys wore scarlet caps and skated on the ice. The poor little swallow grew colder and colder, but he would not leave the prince. He loved him too well. He picked up crumbs outside the baker's door when the baker was not looking, and tried to keep himself warm by flapping his wings. But at last he knew that he was going to die. He had just strength to fly up to the prince's shoulder once more. Goodbye, dear prince, he murmured. Will you let me kiss your hand? I am glad that you are going to Egypt at last, little swallow, said the prince. You have stayed too long, but you must kiss me on the lips, for I love you. It is not to Egypt that I am going, said the swallow. I am going to the house of death. Death is a brother of sleep, is he not? And he kissed the happy prince on the lips and fell down dead at his feet. At that moment a curious crack sounded inside the statue, as if something had broken. The fact is that the leaden heart had snapped right in two. It certainly was a dreadfully hard frost. Early the next morning the mayor was walking in the square below, in company with the town councillors. As they passed the column he looked up at the statue. Dear me, how shabby the happy prince looks, he said. How shabby indeed, cried the town councillors, who always agreed with the mayor, and they went up to look at it. The ruby has fallen out of his sword, his eyes are gone, and he's golden no longer, said the mayor in fact. He is little better than a beggar. Little better than a beggar, said the town councillors. And here is actually a dead bird at his feet, continued the mayor. We must really issue a proclamation that birds are not allowed to die here. And the town clerk made a note of the suggestion. So they pulled down the statue of the happy prince. As he is no longer beautiful, he is no longer useful, said the art professor of the university. Then they melted the statue in a furnace, and the mayor held a meeting of the corporation to decide what was to be done with the metal. We must have another statue, of course, he said, and it shall be a statue of myself. Of myself, said each of the town councillors, and they quarrelled. When I last heard of them, they were quarrelling still. What a strange thing, said the overseer of the workmen at the foundry. This broken lead heart will not melt in the furnace. We must throw it away. 
so they threw it on a dust heap where the dead swallow was also lying. Bring me the two most precious things in the city, said God to one of his angels, and the angel brought him the leaden heart and the dead bird. You have rightly chosen, said God, for in my garden of paradise this little bird shall sing for evermore, and in my city of gold the happy prince shall praise me.